Hello, my name's Jess Starnes and I'm a museum professional and artist who mostly creates work that focuses on neurodivergent experiences. I've been involved in the British Art Network's Emerging Curators Group and as part of this I've had the opportunity to research an area of British art. The Emerging Curators Group is a supportive forum for next generation of curators in the UK, enabling peers to come together and share experiences and thinking around creating British art. I've interviewed five artists about their creative practice and if neurodiversity should be considered an art movement similar to the disability art movement. Can you tell us your name and about your creative practice? My name is Rachel Parry. I am an artist, a producer and a curator. I'm based in Nottingham in the UK. I work predominantly across live art and performance, but I also make installation sound and currently in the last couple of years, more working with new technology, but a very typical of one of those artists that finds new tools and curiosities. So I, I, I do work in other areas such as sculpture, painting, printmaking and, and, and other avenues. So I'm, I'm never fully pinned down to one medium. Could you tell us about some of your work that focuses on neurodiversity? I kind of feel my artwork now is being re-articulated as through a lens of living with hidden disabilities and the layering of my bodily disabilities and my neurodivergencies and reframed after some of the diagnoses and really learning what that means to me. I feel it's quite important to disclose things like I'm a working class artist and I use both they, them, she, her as my pronoun and I'm a queer artist. And much of my past artwork has explored the kind of thread through it is this kind of identity grotesque, looking at how we process trauma and gathering up all these memories and exploring them in movement because I do a kind of some form of choreography in my work as well and rituals, which then moved on to more looking at self-care within the image making. There's a lot of writing, a lot of drawing, a lot of making, a lot of behind the scenes stuff of gathering up all these residues to then make something that then I put out into the world. Um, I'm very interested in the liveness and the present and the meeting of other people to have an encounter. There is some avenues of my work that is more socially engaged and very interested in other people's stories and how we work together collaboratively or separately or as a community. But predominantly in my own solo work, I make this body-based artwork. It's always been about navigating the world where many of the rules don't make sense to me. Um, using my own rituals, some things that have been inherited, other things that I've made up myself, my movements, my playing. A lot of my work comes from play. I get curious about things. I want to know answers that I might not never find the answer to. I think a lot of my work is being re-articulated now with this emphasis of neurodivergency and the disability crossover. Because for over 30 years, I didn't know. I just was weird to people and that can make you feel quite alienated and sometimes you find your people and it's like oh yeah you do that too cool <laughs> why I am wired up differently in lots of ways because I have multiple neurodivergent labels that make up my brain it's like it makes sense everything makes sense why I did that why I continue to want to be curious and play and um, why I make this kind of work are the harder parts of the art world to navigate, even if you are neurotypical. But then when you add on these layers of who we are, navigating a very different operating system set up for not for us, wherever we might be on the spectrums can cause some more overwhelming difficulties to navigate and misunderstandings and layer of more trauma so you know whilst in one pocket being neurodivergent finding our finding my passion finding my curiosities has saved me but then in other ways it's become very difficult how do you go forward how do you how do you grow you know but then reframing it recently because obviously being a late diagnosis 
did those like levels of like, like stages of grief. And you like look back and go, oh, if I was a child and people knew I wouldn't have been picked on, I wouldn't have had teachers get angry with me. And maybe I wouldn't have had to stay up so late to try and finish my work. Maybe when I did my strange movements that nobody understood why I did it. And then finally I find out that it's stimmy, you know, little things like that. And then how it that gets then put into the work that has always been there, but I didn't have the language or the words to hold it. It's probably worth mentioning that I'm also the artistic di director of Little Wolf Parade. So that's a platform supporting other artists since 2012. There was a need in Nottingham, in the city, to bring other artists together and find new ways of putting on work and especially live work. I also run a thing called Guerrilla Art Lab, was created out of a need for all my art friends are neurodivergent. Not all of them, but a lot of them are, and we didn't know. And all of a sudden it made sense. That's why we get on, why we connect and get one another. And all of a sudden I had a group of people that were telling me, well, these are the things that I'm struggling with. And I was like, yeah, same. And it felt really nice. So we created a space. And myself and another a neurodivergent artist called Annette Foster developed a program of art and a space for other neurodivergent artists to feel like they had somewhere to go that round themselves, share practice without it feeling like a heavy crit, like you would have in a university setting. It was invited artists, we ran with programs, and we um, had this just really amazing space but then we went nomadic and so we went to other spaces we would find other people that would take on so for like two years we we met pretty much every friday which is quite an amazing thing and it was like our friday night was hanging out making work sharing work you didn't have to show every week you could just hang out we had iPads on the side, so if people couldn't make it in because um, that for whatever reason, they could still be included. So we were already trying to find ways for inclusion whilst also navigating our own everyday things. We developed from these howl sessions every Friday, a new program of how to support other artists and how to teach our own individual tools and skills. So in the end, I developed a thing called Performing Alchemy, where it was about how to navigate making work together en masse as a big group and then individual. And some of the things that we developed were around other people's self-soothing. So it was like looking at choreographing my, my self-soothing. I didn't even know I did it was holding myself in, like rocking. Um, and sometimes doing tapping here and, and, and for years hiding it in my pocket and not realizing that I did that. So we developed like our own new language that we shared and it was very beautiful. Leading on to the kind of the funded project that I'm doing right now, it's called Malfunctioning Perfectly and I'm partnered with Near Now in Nottingham, which is a new technology and a studio based out of a Broadway media centre. And I also collaborated with the Justice Museum. The project started with just the ADHD. I'm making a chatbot with a really great creative technologist called Rachel Smith and collaborating with a few other artists that work in very different realms to myself. We're giving the robot ADHD and we're playing around with the idea that there's going to be sculpture, the sculpture talks, and we're going to explore, because I always say, like, I'm considered as a malfunction. I'm considered like I'm broken. If you like look at DSM, it's like always like looking at this, how to improve and cure or whatever. But I'm more interested 
in like the social model of disability and looking at what my needs might be and other people's needs, my deep thinking, my fast thoughts, my kind of obsessions and super interests and some of my super interests is robots and new technology and space and futurism. It came about in like a really silly little conversation that was in passing that the first two chatbots ever made were Eliza and Parry and they were health bot, one for looking at schizophrenia and another one for like just alleviating, you know, that kind of psychiatry kind of work. But that was my great grandma's name. And it's just a random little coincidence that I ran with and went, how funny would it be to recreate that bot and people come and experience and talk to it. And it has my answers, but also it creates its own. So I'm like the human in the loop with the other Rachel, giving it different kind of variations of it's like called temperature. So sometimes it will follow the guidelines and sometimes it will just say what some random thing which is a bit like me sometimes I say something that feels very random to other people but it's because it's happening here and it takes a long time to come here or I don't know when it's my turn to talk or what I over talk or I get excitable or I go mute sometimes so you know we're gonna play around with that too I'm a little bit behind with my project some of it is COVID related and other people's workloads. I spent like a few weeks going, it's okay. You don't have, it's not your fault. You don't have to be on a time. You have to listen to like the world has other needs. And but I think that's another thing, like can't talk for every neurodivergent person out there, but like for me in particular, like I feel the stresses of trying to fit into the neurotypical world and I'm trying to change what that looks like so it doesn't matter if I'm behind in this structure that I set out to say that I would do this by this time that the flexibility needs to be there. My research suggests that there are more artists creating work about neurodivergent experiences in recent years. Why do you think this might be? I think that there is a lot more people disclosing their neurodivergency and other kind of parallel disabilities activism and support going on. People are meeting with one another in various ways. And I think there's a lot of knowledge being shared through other kind of platforms and social media. I think that the more we talk about what it is from our experiences, the more unity and support can be cultivated and the public will start to learn. So many people have heard me talk in friendship groups and like our colleagues about what it is like for me now I know about it and the more I've spoken to them some people have gone off and got their own diagnoses of course I know that you don't have to be diagnosed to claim neurodivergency and also there's lots of issues within getting diagnosed that like took me what four years of doctors just saying it's just trauma, it's just borderline personality disorder and other things that they've diagnosed me with, but they, they all sit together and make up my unique experience. I think there's a lot of people like myself who have been late diagnosed and um, are only just finding out, well, that thing that I struggle with, I don't. I didn't have a word for it. I didn't know that it was a thing. I think that there's a shift in kind of what's happening in art institutions and galleries, museums, et cetera. Anyway, I think there's a shift in how doctors are talking about it. And maybe there's lots of issues with that, but a lot of people are coming forward and asking for their diagnosis. And there's a lot of pressure groups out there that are saying, you know, things need you need to realize like we make up a mass percentage of the population, like some particular working environments are not supportive and understanding of a different way of being. 
and don't realize how much we can give with our different way of thinking and, and, and it being. And I think, you know, that we can't fit ourselves into these, is it square? round peg square holes or squ the other way around yeah that one i think that a lot of people have been fed up of being mistreated and in the art world especially with all the different movements that are very needed right now especially in like a hostile environment globally probably the more we talk and more we kind of like find ways to support one another wherever we are in that journey whether it's not diagnosed identifying whether it's diagnosed from childhood adult diagnosis think maybe they are it might be just somebody who is another artist that also isn't and totally neurotypical and it's about where do we connect within this whole big spectrum of wonderful brains and needs and I think it's about empowerment because from the people who I've supported in the past and then other people who supported me, it's meant that we can then find ways forward. We might not always have the answers, but there has to be some acknowledgement of the amount of mistreatment a lot of people have had of behaving or preparing to behave differently but not being able to keep up with certain ideas of what a workload should look like and the alienation of behaving differently in public spaces, in galleries, et cetera. And that just because I can be like quite well-spoken and, and articulate myself, you know, that, you know, just because I can do that now and I might have moments like wonkiness, like the labor of, the wider fitting in into an art world is is humongous and can make you feel like you don't fit and what's the point it's like understanding all the nuances and listening to not just people like myself and yourself but, but all of people and the people who are nonverbal and the people who maybe are being excluded from being able to right and, and be included in the art movements i said before we started before we started recording like how nervous i was because it is scary because disclosing my need and just it's like it's almost like we're taught that this is selfish i worry about tokenism i worry sometimes a little bit about like People ticking boxes on funding bids, but then not always realizing, you know, still want me to do a massive written form or they ask me to talk. Can you imagine like I'd be talking like this in an application? And in some ways, would that be okay for me to talk about my work like this? Because I don't think they, I mean, I, I have done it like this and it's not been accepted because they don't understand what I'm talking about. And that happens a lot because there's so much going on and I'm distracted by the sounds that are happening in the street. But yeah, I think a different pace. I mean, what I'd really love is a universal art credit for, for, for all artists, you know, but that's another fight. But lots of people who are banding together as like little communities and talking quite a lot about neurodivergent needs. I think there's some great charities that are also doing things as well i think it's about i definitely do think we we do need some kind of movement because movement means going forward or sideways or walking around and wibbly ways and finding ways to support one another builds public awareness like i said before and it's wherever people are on their journey, because there should be some form of like signposting, you know, that even by talking and sharing our stories, some good, some hard, some difficult ones, you know, I think it's like people identify with that. Or, and then also even like this week, like I share with people what I know and like 
telling people, oh, this person's a bit brighter. Like, don't struggle by yourself. Like, you know, I struggled for 10 years and like wasn't getting anything. It was really difficult. Like suddenly somebody helped me and it was like, I got something and I had lots of problems with that structure and it does need to change. But I think only by bringing us all together in some ways, this is what it is. This is what it stands for, kind of a, like a manifesto. This is why it's important. This is um, some areas where you might want to look at for help. Here's some fun videos because I am fed up of reading a million things to find out the answers. But yeah, I think definitely need something to bond us together and feel empowered and feel okay with not just okay no not just in k feel feel like proud what one change would have the biggest impact on neurodivergent artists the uh, acceptance and finding a better way to hold the needs of artists who are neurodivergent i've had a uh, 18 months of un <laughs> metaphorically unmasking whilst also masking because yeah, COVID, bad joke. So 18 months of just like really listening to what I need and learning what my new tools might be. I've had a little bit of coaching and I've had a little bit of body doubling and I've really worked on myself on what that looks like. And I think as I re-enter and everybody else re-enters into whatever it is next week, you know, I don't want to hide that aspect of my authentic self anymore. I want to be fully me. I don't want to be pulled up every five minutes on things I might do that are different. I want to be accepted. I think the biggest thing is radical empathy and understanding and kindness 